Section 43 of The Soul or Rational Psychology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amy Graymore. The Soul or Rational Psychology by Emanuel Swedenborg. Translated by Frank Sewall, 1837 to 1915, and others. Section 43. 27 of the immortality of the soul what the soul is has been defined and described above namely that it is immaterial without extension or motion or parts hence it contains in itself nothing that will perish but these are rather verbal predictions than true definitions inasmuch as these names do not suit the higher forms although they have something analogous thereto in their meaning for except from analogy one cannot avoid in the above definition the idea of nothing. Hence we betake ourselves rather to the form itself of the soul. Since it is said that the form of the soul is spiritual, and that in the spiritual form those things are infinite which are finite in inferior forms. According to this description, also every idea of place, thus of centre and surface, above and below, hence of motion and extent, perishes or is abolished. This follows from the idea itself of the form, namely, that it contains nothing in it which can perish. For there must be a changing in the position and connection of parts in whatever perishes or is destroyed, and in a form which embraces no idea of place, centre, surface, or in which the centre and the circumference and surface are everywhere, destruction cannot be conceived of. This form is the very contrary of destruction looking only to perpetuity and indeed the more it is attacked the more it resists every effort of destruction if we examine forms in their order it appears that as the form becomes higher or ascends to something superior there is always something of perpetuity added thus in proceeding from the angular to the circular the circle becomes perpetual and all the lines and planes conspire to a certain perpetuity but since this form both by expansion from centre to circumference and also by resisting the blow of other objects on its surface either returns to itself or enters upon some other state therefore lest it the circular form should perish by expansion there is that which is perpetual in the spiral form for the coils terminate in a kind of circular surface and return to it and so by expansion as also by this returning and keeping the unbroken surface in view this figure is more sure of permanence but still inasmuch as this spiral figure has regard to a centre it is yet liable to destruction the possibility of perishing is done away with however in the forms still superior as in the vertical and celestial thus such is the perpetuity in the spiritual form that by virtue of its very nature the form is secure for one determination so regards another that each renders the other entirely safe from every injury this results from the form itself and the perfection in which it was created moreover the spiritual form draws its essence immediately from god by inspiration as a child from its parent wherefore it acknowledges deity or god himself as its father immediately in creation and that it is and exists from the immortal and eternal self and can neither be destroyed nor become mortal this is the reason why the soul is immortal not from itself but from god who alone is immortal in himself thus through him does the soul become so since therefore the soul is the inmost and supreme of all forms the first natural form itself is beneath it and the inferior forms recede even to the angular as earth recedes from heaven hence the soul can in no wise be touched still less destroyed by these lower forms which are in nature tell me how can that which is inmost be destroyed by those things which are without or that which is supreme by those which are below or that which is simple by those which are compound or what is prior by what is posterior or what is most perfect in itself by things which are imperfect in themselves for the imperfect derives its ability to exist at all from the perfect qualities which it contains 
that which has in itself the infinite cannot be touched by the finite still less destroyed what is constant in itself cannot be destroyed by what is inconstant the very superior forms themselves especially the spiritual are able to undergo infinite changes of their state since in this their perfection consists if we suppose any attack collision or the like to take place such as occurs in inferior forms then its state is able to be changed in any manner and even to return to its natural state comparatively as the natural substances which are most elastic can be bent and unbent expanded and compressed and still return to their own form thus as they are acted upon so they act and hence cannot be forced by any power or shock out of their natural state hence it now follows that nothing terrestrial can by any means touch the soul whether it be what flows in air ether or fire nor anything atmospheric not even the most pure fire of nature all these are far below the soul and have no contact with it nor if they did could they exercise the least force for the soul is safe in its own form this also is evident in the body itself where there is so great a disturbance of the most volatile parts taken up from the earth the aerial atmosphere and the ether but still these do not disturb or injure even the least organic connection place or order myriads of the substances such as belong to the soul might meet in the smallest angular form it would be like saying that a large beam might split into a single particle of some ether when the fact is that myriads of such ether particles touch so obtuse a mass and even permeate its pores or as if you should say that the posts and beams of a house would extinguish the abstractive and directive force of the magnet when this flows through the metals themselves and all things such would be the injuring or the obstructing of the operation of the soul or spirit by those things which are the most minute angular forms of nature or fire for the magnetic force itself pervades even fire and flame although in vertical forms what then must not the soul be capable of which possesses a form above the celestial besides it is contrary to nature that that can be destroyed which is without weight or lightness or which does not resist any weight but acts according as it is acted upon or where action and passion exactly correspond but what agent can there be to destroy the soul since there can be none without or below it for such things do not touch it and in order to destroy the determinations themselves of the soul the agent must at least reach them and touch them but that also which is above does not destroy the soul for this is divine this preserves rather than destroys and all the more surely since human souls are the ends of creation and constitute the kingdom of god nor indeed does that which is within destroy the soul but it rather preserves it as has been said above of form showing how this protects itself spiritual death however is not the destruction of essence and of life but of the better life itself inasmuch as the soul is removed from the love of god from wisdom felicity and perfection and has ceased to be the image of god and in heaven this constitutes spiritual death for life itself consists of the truly spiritual loves and when these are extinct and in their place the contrary loves succeed or hatreds then that is said to be dead which truly lived truly to live is to love god and to be wise in such life remains that form itself and that essence itself which cannot perish but there is only a perversion of state or the state of the form is so changed that it no longer corresponds with the divine loves and thus that image of god is lost which requires a state conformable to its loves but it is asked why the life itself appears to die and be destroyed with our body or what appears to be the life itself rather of the body indeed than of the soul as in the case of swoonings and ecstasies dreams drownings the buried coming to life embryonic existence and other instances where the subjects are entirely ignorant after their resuscitation into the bodily life that they have been living meanwhile no sign remains impressed on their memory of what they have thought 
or indeed of their having thought at all from these and similar examples it appears as if life were merely corporeal and not at all of the soul but in these as in innumerable other instances we are deluded by appearances for the life of the soul is not like that of our sensation or perception or even like that of our thought but is more perfect and superior flowing into the thought itself and perfecting it in order that the mind may think but the thought itself is something that is learned by practice it is a faculty of the rational mind and it perishes together with the body what the pure life and intelligence of the soul is and how it flows into the thought may appear from reflection alone in that namely the soul naturally enters into all the secrets of any knowledge when it operates in the body and in the sensations and thoughts this knowledge being not acquired by the soul but inborn and flowing in from the life of the soul does not the eye explore all the secrets of optics the ear those of acoustics in order to know of itself and of its own nature how to form sounds and how to put together what shall be harmonious does not even a little boy whenever he thinks or forms a judgment or speaks traverse all the first philosophy logic dialects grammar and so forth yea the most hidden things of these sciences thus it is that we learn from ourselves all this knowledge when the soul acts or produces the least action or moves a muscle it runs through all chemistry mechanics mathematics and physics hence may appear what the life of the soul is in itself namely that it is such as it is of itself it is not something acquired by learning like the knowledge of the rational mind whence come imagination and thought therefore the inmost life or essence of thought derives its origin from the soul and thus thoughts may be withdrawn and still the life of the soul or the highest spiritual intelligence remain since the life of the soul is such as we have described it cannot leave any impress on our rational mind for it is an intelligence so universal pure simple and superior that its thought cannot be exercised by means of words or material ideas in the manner that we think hence it can neither impress the sensory nor in the absence of the ideas of memory induce any change in it inasmuch therefore as the soul in such wise shapes its ideas without speaking words but rather understanding inwardly those things which the mind speaks or thinks it follows that this life of the soul can least of all impress anything of its memory on the mind which understands things only in the crudest manner comparatively but that this very life of the soul is our own yea is the life of the body itself and that we are to return into it after the dissolution of the body is apparent from this that the soul is that which experiences sensation namely it hears it sees it perceives it thinks judges wills but according to an organic form and not otherwise this also is vividly shown in that the soul does not seem to live separately from its bodily organs except as these external forms are successively destroyed thus the sight appears as if it were in the eye but the eye being closed we will still see with a sight and the more the eye is closed the more the internal sight and imagination are perfected and so much is this the case that the external sight may be rather a hindrance than otherwise to the internal sight likewise the imagination and thought seem so to cohere that without the imagination the thought would seem to perish but yet in order to think profoundly and to enter inmostly into things themselves it is necessary to remove the material ideas of the imagination or to abstract the mind from material things since only thus can we think purely this comes by abstraction thus the thought returns and is separated as it were from its external form such thought also leaves almost no impress whatever on the internal sensory except so far as it has become fixed in some material idea or figure when now this entire material idea recedes there remains the life of the soul which can make no impression on the sensory 
nor does it put itself forth as it is in the embryo or infant, although it is possessed of just as much intelligence in the smallest infant as in an adult mind of the acutest judgment. But it is unable to put itself forth except so far as the rational mind is furnished with ideas of the memory, by means of which it may express itself. Such is the life of the soul unmixed with ignorance, having no imperfection, having all knowledge in itself, so that it may be knowledge itself, truth, order, and intelligence. As such can by no means perish. Nature which is destructible is subject to it, and so the life of that form seems to die. The veriest life of the soul is the veriest life appertaining to us and it does not come to itself so that we may be conscious of it before all that life of the forms which are below itself, and in which it has been involved, has receded. These the soul itself destroys in order that it may free itself from their chains, and be restored to its own right and freedom of acting. For just as the soul knows how to form its own body, one viscous after another, how to escape from the womb, how to nourish itself at the breast, and many other things, even as the caterpillar knows how to transform itself into the butterfly, and to destroy its pristine form, so also does the soul know how to destroy its own forms, to restore itself to liberty, and thus to migrate from this dying, imperfect, and inconstant life to that which is immortal. And this could not take place without the death of the body's life. From these very operations of the soul, it may be seen what its form is. For the soul is that very substance in which form has its being. Its intelligence is that distinguishing faculty and quality of the forces and modifications which we call form. Thus from form, and also from intelligence itself, it may be deduced and clearly seen that the soul is immortal. End of section 43